This is Trep Wire with a special podcast. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of Siri Finance. And joining us today is Michael Bull, founder and CEO of Bull Realty and an active commercial real estate advisor. Many of you know him as the host of America's Commercial Real Estate Show. Michael, welcome. Oh, thank you. Glad to be with you. Good to have you. Give us a quick overview of your background for those that may not know you well. Okay. Well, in the 32nd version, I've been in commercial brokerage for 35 years. I owned a management company when I was uh, really young uh, and did well selling apartments mainly uh, as a young broker and then started Bull Realty in Atlanta, commercial brokerage firm about 22 years ago. And uh and now I'm licensed in nine Southeast states. We have 30 brokers working in every, most every specialty. And, um, and then, as you mentioned, I started the show 10 years ago and been uh, taping a new show uh, on commercial real estate every week for 10 years. Um, so, um, and then I have a training company that does uh, online video training for commercial agents uh, that I've had out for about two and a half years called Commercial Agent Success. That's the 30 second view. <laughs> so we have uh, about nine uh, nine years and two months to go to catch up. <laughs> so you're based out of Atlanta and I know you, uh, you cover the entire country, but you've got a home base in that region. Give us an idea of what's going on in that area right now. Well, it's interesting. I went to Chicago for business about, I guess it's now four weeks ago. And they shut down right after we left. You, you know, you couldn't go inside. And, you know, you come back to Atlanta and you go, wow, um, COVID what? What's COVID? I mean, <laughs> some of Atlanta has really opened up, especially the, the suburban markets and close-in suburban markets um, pretty much open. Um, the, um, you know, still the office buildings, especially where there's um, elevators and high rises, there's still a lot of empty spaces. Uh, people, a lot of people still working at home, still less traffic uh, around Atlanta. Uh, but the economy seems to be, for the most part, doing uh, pretty well. You know, we have a div very diverse economy here uh, in Atlanta. You know, the home business is, you know, I guess, doing pretty well everywhere. Uh, it's doing well here. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's more open. Uh, you know, I tell some of our clients in other cities, hey, come to Atlanta. It's open. We can go out to a restaurant. Have a toast. <laughs> Before we get into the current crisis and, and what's going on and what you're seeing on the ground, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that you've been in this game for uh, 35 years. So you saw, you know, the early 1990s, you know, crushing uh, uh, recession in real estate, obviously the 2008 to 2012 period. And now we're in the, the COVID uh, recession, depression, whatever you want to call it. How does this compare to previous times and, and what's the level of panic like for property owners um, at this point compared to other crises? Well, I think the, if you look at the Great Recession, I don't know what was really great about it, but that's what people <laughs> call it, right? Um, there's a lot less, uh, it's a lot less scary. I think people realized that that was going to last a while. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of problems with the capital and the banking. And, you know, I think the, the big difference is I think a lot of lenders and owners and people think that, you know what, once we get a, a vaccine out and get it in, you know, things are going to start coming back to normal. And one of the biggest things I think is different is there's so much capital. You know, there's, there's, there's debt, um, there's equity. Um, there's so much capital. I think that's the biggest difference. I remember going to ICSC uh, and, and seeing people that had already signed up for, to have these big booths and they were in hiding in their booths, not wanting to see anyone. And everybody's like, anybody got any money? Anybody got any money? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like, everybody's got money. And they're like, where can I put it? I can't, I can't find a place to put it. You know? I think it's the biggest difference. Well, it's funny this week we saw the uh, the sale of Bob Dylan's recording rights and Stevie Nicks. So people are looking for alternative outlets to uh, deploy capital everywhere right <laughs> yeah, now. And, right. and I think that that's a, a sign that uh, there's just enormous demand right now uh, for 
feed generating income everywhere. So yeah, uh, it, it is very interesting. And I agree. Um, 100%. Yeah, we've got we've, we've been really active in several sectors. Um, and we've seen a lot of capital competing for properties, um, you know, in industrial and in a government office and in medical office and in single tenant net lease. Uh, just, it's just crazy. A lot of buyers, a lot of capital. Do you think that capital extends at this point to uh, the retail and the hotel segments uh, down in Atlanta and nationally, I know you have a footprint kind of across the country. You know, what are you seeing in those two markets in terms of uh, capital availability and um, borrower distress? You know, I think there's still a kind of kick it down, kick the can down the road uh, mentality there. Um, you know, we do have a hospitality division and, um, you know, a lot of the lenders and, and hotel owners are saying, hey, let's kick it hand down the road and see what happens and before we fire sale. So while we're selling some notes um, and working in some distress deals in the hospitality world, uh, we're not seeing as much opportunities for investors as the investors are looking for. Uh, we're, you know, that, uh, that bid ask gap is, is, is really there, uh, I think, in the hotels uh, yet. And then in, in retail, you know, obviously some retail is doing really well and, and some is, is, uh, is not and is distressed. It's a lot, a lot of the big box. But then there's also, you know, one thing about retail is it's usually good property. So, you know, some of that property is, you know, obviously being redeveloped and repurposed and, um, and is selling for, and for other uses, whether it's the existing buildings or, or raised them and building something new. So some of that, you know, retail is, is moving. Are you seeing an increase in those kind of repositionings over the last, even before COVID? Or is that more still one of those things that we read in, in the Wall Street Journal or in other articles because it sounds cool and fancy, but it's not really <laughs> happening as much as, as you would think? No, it's happening. There's a lot of um, multifamily developers, um, uh, mixed-use developers, and others looking for sites where if and uh you know for last mile and as well for delivery logistics so i think if you can zone it especially in you know good sub markets there's a lot of buyers looking for that um to repurpose those properties and there's so much land with those so much land in those garden those uh parking lots right yeah that's that's true i mean a lot of those properties are are flat they're cleared uh they have good visibility they're in accessible uh, decent areas uh it is good it's good real estate so separate for us you were talking a minute ago about you know some retail doing very well uh i assume that that's kind of grocery anchored and maybe walmart anchored some's not doing well of course there's been uh endless headlines about shopping malls uh is that how you see it at this point or is it more nuanced than that now, I see that as well. Another thing that I see is um, CBD versus uh, suburban. Like even in Atlanta, we can go to some of these suburban markets around Atlanta and they're just crazy bu busy. Retailers are killing it. Restaurants are killing it. But then the, when you go closer in, in, more dense environments where a lot of the office, uh, re the office employees are not going in the offices and those retailers are suffering. Uh, so I don't see that, that difference as well. Turning to, to hotels for a minute, you know, can you give us the same kind of comparison on the hotel market, right? You talked about some of the distinctions between suburban and CBD uh, on retail, as well as, you know, what the tenant base is. What do you see on the hotel side in terms of leisure versus business, uh, suburban versus uh, inner city? Uh, are there the similar types of distinctions there? Similar. I think one of the things we see in the hotels is the drive-to markets, uh, are doing okay, right? If you can drive to the hotel, there's a, something to do there, you know, from a major city, um, then you're doing well. If it's a convention type hotel, it's not doing well, right? Um, so that's kind of one of the differences that we see uh, in the hotel world. So Michael, you mentioned the, um, the retail and CBD not doing as well. And uh, part of that is of course, driven by the fact that there aren't anybody, there's not a lot of people driving into the office at this point or taking the train into the office, depending on where you are. Um, 
you said you have a lot of experience in the office sector. You know, what are you, what are you seeing right now? And then even more importantly, is this one of those things where we're going to come out of this three years from now and say, can you believe the crazy stuff we were saying was going to happen office buildings three years ago? Or are we going to look back three years from now and say, can you believe we used to do that and sit in, everyone used to go to the same office all the time? What do you think there? Well, that's a good, great question. And I think we'll see a little bit of both of that. Um, but, you know, I think these companies and employees, I love the uh, surveys. 90% uh, of uh, employees surveyed said they are really doing well at home and they're getting a lot done. They're very productive. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 90% uh, of those, 89% of those 90 are not really that productive. <laughs> I mean, uh, we've been very productive during COVID. We've sold uh, just my team, I lead an office sales team. We sold five large office buildings and just trying to do business with these companies that have worked from home. It's difficult. The calls are take longer to, to get return calls. You know, that you can't go to someone's office down the, down the hall and, and ask and get things done. Uh, I think that when people get over COVID, they're going to want to get back in offices. I think the companies are going to have trouble with recruiting with training, you know, with onboarding, with culture, collaboration, and ultimately uh, with profits. And um, they're going to see that they need the office. And if you look at some of these, you know, the Microsofts and the Facebooks, and they're saying, oh yeah, everybody can work at home, that's great. But what are they doing? They're out buying headquarters and, and signing leases. You know, I think smart business leaders know that they're going to be more productive they're going to get better talent, recruit and retain talent, be more productive when they have a great environment for these people. And some of them are going to even want more office space. They're going to want more square footage per person. I mean, you think about the square footage per person, what had happened. I know brokers, my friends at other shops that I do business with, and they said, look, they, they crammed us down to so much little square feet per person, these open areas, that I never go back there. And then all that collaborations lost, that learning from the, the older folks, learning from the younger and the younger from the older. You know, I think these companies are going to see they need to get back. So I predict in 18 to 36 months, there's going to be huge demand for office again. And I think that time period is going to vary based on the economy. You know, with these shutdowns around the world and around the U.S., you know, that's going to have a long-term impact. And I think when companies feel comfortable, um, they're going to want more office space. So I think we're going to have uh, this whole next year, I think there's going to be really low demand and then it'll start picking up. And I think in 2022, we'll see demand for office coming back. And to your point, think about 911, 9-11. Oh, no one's going to go in these high rises in New York again. They did. They will. We want to, we're going to be back in New York. We're going to be back in Boston. We're going to be back in downtown Atlanta. That's just how we always have been. We're going to do it again. So tell us a little bit about the Bull Realty experience. Are your employees coming to the office now? And uh, if not, are they among the uh, 89 that are unproductive or the, uh, the one that are productive? Well, hold on, I'm going to go over and shut my door before I answer that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have about, let's see, we have about 30 brokers and we have about 15 that work here every day. Um, but in, in our employees, we have 10 employees and they're most all working here. We, um, but we have a bit of a different environment. We have about 550 square feet per person. We have private offices. I always thought and I always think to this day that employees and turnover are your are, are people are your value and they're your biggest cost real estate is cheap compared to turning over people uh, and losing talent that's expensive and so i've always had more space you know we have a game room a pool table room we have a television studio we have a cafe we have pr big private offices are on glass. Are you recruiting right now, Michael? This sounds <laughs> like a recruiting I'm pitch. my realtor's license. <laughs> are you taking resumes? Yeah. <laughs> sounds like a yeah. recruiting pitch. Yeah, gourmet coffee and beer <laughs> in the fridge. And, uh, but, but so I did have an environment that was really a safer environment than any environment, unless they were home hermiting. If they were going anywhere to do anything, 
I have a safer environment than that. We can social distance. And we bought a lot of the nice plexiglass stuff and put in these things to kill all the germs. And yeah, we did a lot of great things to make it, but we haven't had anybody uh, pick up um, COVID here. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's done well. We have a lot of people working here and it's beneficial. I find that more people that are working here, the more excitement, the more, more get, things get done. I can uh, personally vouch for, I mean, I don't necessarily have to go to the office to sit there and do work, but I would, I would take the train in just to have lunch with people, mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of yeah. catch up because, you know, there's so many people that I'm friends with in the office that, you know, you just lose touch with. If you're not working with them every single day, you lose touch. And uh, that's like on a personal level. And I agree on the, on the corporate level as well. I think, you know, the only non-family member that I've seen in person in the last like couple of weeks is the Christmas tree guy, <laughs> right? Like that guy who put the Christmas tree on my car, that was about it. And uh, he was in the, the parking lot of a a giant empty parking lot in the Jefferson Valley mall in upstate New York. So uh, yeah. I was thinking about that when, when I was there saying, look at this, this is, this is beautiful flat land. I wonder what he's paying the mall owner to, to set, to hawk his trees here. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, I'm from your lips to God's ears. We'll be, we'll be back in full force in a year and a half or a couple of years. Yeah. I think of the employee side, you think about career, you ever, you know, think about the fit. Well, you, this guy, this lady, they they moved up the the ladder very quickly because they were spending a lot of time around the C suite. They were playing golf with them. you know they were being the, the you know they got to seeing well we're not seeing anybody now yeah you know, how are you going to get ahead and really impress people when they when they can't see how hard you work and um, you know so I think for career situations as well people are everyone's going to want to get back out and I'm not I mean everyone some people if you could if they could sit in their PJs and you know, working at home, they'll do it. But uh, most people want to want to get out and be social again. Yeah, that training onboarding thing is a real big one. We've we've had that yeah. same thing. It's like I could just sit in a conference room with you for two hours and get done what takes me two weeks and ten Zoom calls. You know, <laughs> right? We had one guy start right as COVID started here, <laughs> brand new, and uh, he had his experience in his field in senior housing, but brand new to brokerage. And uh, since COVID started, we're, you know, trying to onboard him, he's like, hasn't met, you know, a third of our people ever. Uh, and, uh, but luckily he got an $80 million listing that we're about to take out. So he's, he's going to do okay. But can you imagine if you tell people that are really good, oh, you, you should, you're going to love our culture. You're going to love our people. Oh, but you're going to be home by yourself. You're not going to meet anyone. <laughs> <laughs> We saw some big headlines in the last week or so uh, about big corporate moves. We saw uh, HP uh, announce its plans to move its enterprise group from Silicon Valley to the Houston area. Uh, earlier this week, there was a story that said Goldman may move its uh, asset management group to either uh, Dallas or perhaps South Florida. Do you think the, the uh, pandemic accelerates any trends that were kind of tabled you know, uh, either moves for taxation reasons, move for smaller space, move for um, uh, a cheaper workforce opportunities, or, or do we really pick up, like you said a little while ago, kind of where we were pre-COVID, maybe 18 months, 24 months from now? You know, I think it's a good question. I think a lot of that's going to, we're going to see that pan out. I think there's going to be still a bit of a pause for people making, a lot of big companies making a lot of decisions um except for the companies that realize this might be the time to get that new headquarters um you know get that deal and i know we just took a, a small building and it was like twenty eight thousand square feet to market vacant and i thought hmm wonder how that's going to do it's got multiple competing offers that, because they're wanting to they've seen it's a good time to buy a property for their office or to lease a property. So I think companies looking for good deals that see that, um, that we are going to get through this are going to make some moves and they're going to look for the places to your point uh, where they have a good employee base. Uh, they have, I think a lot of companies will be concerned about in, in increasing tax rates um, and they're going to look for, for those locations. 
Michael, I think because you're in a uh, business with, with a lot of uh, transactional activity, you get some insights into things that maybe those of us that are in this world don't see firsthand. I'm curious, going forward, do you think businesses are going to change how they do certain things, practices, operations, as a result of long-term shift in tenant preferences? Well, I think there are going to be a, there's going to be a shift toward more flexible leases. I don't think that goes away. I think that was already starting. I mean, if you look at some of the shifts that were happening, um, you know, some of these companies were going away from smaller square footage per employee. They were realizing it was problematic, especially when they were trying to recruit and retain talent. Um, they were going to larger spaces per square foot. Um, I think you're going to see... Uh, the desire for the flexibility in the leases uh, that it's going to continue. I'm seeing more and more landlords that are comfortable. We're uh, just talking to a lender today, closing a loan on an office building and was helping him get comfortable with, look, I know your box says you want to have certain percentage of long-term leases and the weighted average lease term is not what you would like, but this is the new era and you can actually get higher rents. Tenants in some cases will pay more rent because they have the flexibility and guess what? A lot of times they just stay. Um, so I think some of those, some of those trends uh, where are sped up and, and they're going to continue. Um, I think there will be more uh, flexible uh, employee situations for working from home. Um, but I think ultimately the back to our points earlier for your career and for productivity, for the most part, a lot of these businesses are going to want to have their people uh, together. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, I've studied sales a lot in my life. And one of the studies I saw that was really interesting that the salespeople that work at home overall do, don't do as well as the salespeople who work in the satellite offices. And those salespeople don't do as well as the people, the salespeople work in the main office. You know, it's like, yeah, we want to be around each other. You look at the, the commercial real estate firms, you know, even in a city like uh, Atlanta, where we're supposed to have all these bad traffic woes and don't have transit, we still just have one office per brokerage firm. You know, we don't have satellite offices everywhere because we know they do better if we could get them together. We talked about in some of our past podcasts that a year ago, um, credit quality of an office tenant was really not something you talked about at all. The economy was moving along really, really well. And everything was, you know, really firing on all cylinders other than perhaps maybe some oil and gas tenants in the, in the Southwest, you know, now you have a situation where maybe that's, that's not so true, where you're really scratching beneath the surface to see, you know, is my tenant going to be a going concern in two years, you know, given the, the type of business they operate, are they a corporate tenant for a, a retailer or, uh, a casual dining firm or an airline. Are you seeing a lot of that? And there's a lot of price differentiation uh, in the market at this point? Yeah, yeah, we are. And and those types of buildings that have those types of tenants, just most of the sellers, you know, aren't going to sell them. Um, and, and investors looking at them are, are looking at every tenant and their industry. Um, you know, we have sold some buildings that were medical and, and, um, Government leased this summer during COVID, we have gotten cap rates that are equal to, or in most cases, compressed. We got higher prices during COVID for those office buildings saying we would have pre-COVID because of your point is that the, the investors see the credit, they see the tenants are going to be there. Um, on the regular office buildings, the ones that we've sold have been more perimeter one story, two story, you know, where the, they're, they're not going up in high rises. People are using those buildings. I was in, I toured six uh, properties last week that were like that, that were suburban. 80% um, of the tenants were in their spaces working and active. Where I come from my high rise and there's, it's 80% empty. Um, so I think uh, the, there's going to be a stall on those sales of those buildings that have those tenants unless the seller has to do it. 
Uh, we're, we're testing one. We just took out a, a small $8.6 million regular office building uh, in West Palm Beach, Florida yesterday, uh, seven cap, 100% occupied, 100% IXP through COVID. And I'm really curious to see how the market looks at that because they're not medical, they're not government, that for the most part, they're nonprofit. Well, are people going to look at that and go, well, do they need their office? Are they going to work at home? Uh, and I think I'm curious to see how the market reacts to that one. Right. That's, you're, you're not only looking at credit risk, you're looking at work from home risk. Right. Right. You could have, you know, triple A credit rating, but, uh, you know, D minus on the WFH. Right. right. Because have... they're much more likely to go work from home. <laughs> yeah, right. We wrote a story not long ago about uh, the American Cancer Association, which is headquartered in Atlanta. And they were looking to give back space. I think it was over the summer because their fundraising was so down uh, because of COVID. And we thought that that was an interesting story at the time because you don't think of them as um, something that would be impacted um, in, in that way. But that was a, a big story in your neck of the woods uh, yeah. a while back. Well, I hope no one looking at my nonprofit office building hears this. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that my college uh, and my high school uh, have not stopped calling me, asking me for money. So uh, wow. the, the nonprofit uh, wheels are still definitely turning. Yeah, that's good. That's good to hear. So Michael, what uh, you talked to a lot of people. So what predictions do you have for 2021 that you'd like to share with our listeners? You know, I think the predictions um, vary for different, you know, areas, different CBD versus suburban, uh, various sectors. Uh, I think the office market is the one that I think is almost more in question. I think, you know, industrial, single tenant, net lease, you know, government office, medical office, all that's just doing extremely well. Everybody knows hotels is doing terrible, are doing terribly, um, and then retail is having its struggles. The one in the middle is the office is like really what's going on there, and I I think that's the one I'm most curious to see what happens. And I think this year, moving ahead of us, 2021, it's going to be uh, less demand. Um, some buyers for office properties are going to get some good opportunities. Um, but then I think in 2022, that demand starts coming back. Um, and then as the economy builds back up, uh, it gets stronger. So I think that's what we're going to see uh, in 2021 as as the things start opening up, things will just slowly start getting better. And, and then by 2022, we'll all be doing the Snoopy dance, which is as happy as we can be. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, before we let you go, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, your business as a, as a running a realty uh, agency and also your show, which has been very successful. And we've heard uh, from a lot of people that we've interviewed that your show is, is a must listen. Um, but you also do sales training. So as someone who's involved with sales a lot, um, give me your top one or two tips that you uh, relay in some of your sales training. And you don't have to give away the secrets. You got to go and, <laughs> you know, you got to go and ask Mike for that. But yeah, well, that's a good question. I think my number one tip in sales is really just taking care of your client. You know, just thinking about your customer and not you, you know, that gives you the focus. It gives you the integrity. It helps you ask the right questions. It helps you provide the right solutions. It helps you use your time wisely. Uh, I think that's the, the number one tip uh, that I would give anyone in any sales environment. Wise words. And I'm gonna guess your favorite interview was probably Tom Fink. <laughs> exactly. How did you know? I don't know. No, I thought it was me when we talked about the wonderful world of Cecil back pre-COVID. <laughs> or maybe Manus. <laughs> there you go. There you Probably go. Think. Well, yeah, one thing that's interesting about uh, doing the show uh, at, as a broker in the business, um, you know how brokers are. We all think we know everything, right? Yes, we do. Um, and uh, when I started the show, I thought, you know, when I interview people who are analysts and, and economists and, and they're at, at these different companies, you know, what are they going to tell me about my business that I don't already know? 
And I think from doing the show, that was one of the one of the interesting things that is, you know, really smart people like like you guys who are are studying the market and look at the market. Um, it, it's incredible to to hear the view and and i think these shows your show my show has helped me really get a, a better view of the commercial real estate world from above and and be able to make decisions and help clients make decisions from a real worldly view rather than just the view from from your your desk um and i think that was one of the things that was really interesting about doing the show is uh you know, how much I learned from, from doing every show. Cause I thought I knew everything at, at 26, you know? So it's, I'm sure you did. If, if my <laughs> children are any indicator, you knew everything at 26. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, we'll close this special podcast. Thank you to our guests, Michael Bull. Thanks to our producer, Keegan St. Anjame. Join us later this week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, send us an email at podcast at trip.com and please visit trip.com for more info and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you as always for listening and stay well. All right. All right.